Well, um, yeah, it was really a good trip, I thought. We went to Glacier Park. You ever heard of Glacier National Park? Who's been to Glacier National Park? Still a glacier there? They're 26. Pretty small, but they're, they're small. They're smaller than they were during the Ice Age, I can tell you that much. In fact, they're smaller than they were during the Little Ice Age. Yeah, and then uh, we went on a geologist guided field trip on sat to Saturday, week ago Saturday, right? Would have been it, week ago Saturday. So there was four or five geologists involved that I know of, several of them that I had met before, the year before. And uh, I didn't learn anything that I thought contradicted the alternative hypothesis that I'm hoping to submit to somebody here real soon. The one that you guys should be familiar with, right? In fact, out of the whole world out there, you guys are the first ones to actually hear in detail this alternative hypothesis. So, um, what is the alternative hypothesis anyway? <laughs> Well, this is a test to see who's been paying attention and who hasn't. Oh, well, we the, the one relative to the field trip. We we went up uh, and did a circuit around Flathead Lake, which is the largest. What is it, Brad? The largest naturally impounded freshwater lake. Thank you. West of the Mississippi. Na largest naturally impounded freshwater lake west of the Mississippi. So it doesn't include the Great Lakes. So I guess I would only. What, only the Great Lakes would be ahead of it, right? So it's, it's left over because uh, where it was was a big lobe of ice, and it would have been at the northern end of Lake Missoula. And so we, in two, two years past, I've shown you guys pictures of part of that area. And in fact, whatever, two months ago when I did a presentation, I showed you the flyover pictures that we had taken from last summer. And one of the things that we had done there was documented evidence that totally contradicts the prevailing theory that there was this big ice dam. Yes, Dennis? You know, all these things on the History Channel and the Science Channel and so forth, where they say, say that the glaciers are speeding up because the water on the top that is melting because of the big sunlight temperatures, that is seeping through. Mm -hmm. going down to the bottom and then it's acting as like a greased skid and so the glaciers are moving faster. Well if all the water is going to the bottom and escaping underneath and that thing really leaves a lot of credence to the fact that you say that the dams wouldn't have held up because the water <laughs> underneath would be. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Dennis, damn you get a double gold star. Man's been paying attention, but even think about that. If you've got if you've got a mile thick sheet of ice and you've got water that's getting all the way to the base of it, only under the force of gravity, atmospheric pressure. Try to imagine when we were driving on our way down here, we commented to Jeremy as we're looking at the skyline of Atlanta. The tallest building in Atlanta is that what is it? The Bank of America building, you know, with the lid up top and the top. That's a what, 1,067 feet. Okay, next time you're driving, you got a good, you're, you're, you're not too far from downtown. Take a look at that building. Because that building is only half, its height is only half the depth of Lake Missoula behind the ice dam. You can't, so you're talking about there a, a body of water 2,100 feet deep. Now, at the, at the bottom of that water column, you've got a pressure of almost a half a ton per square inch. Now, what Dennis was just saying is, you know, when they start talking about glaciers apart from this ice dam theory, they'll, they'll sure, I mean, they'll say right out, yeah, you've got water that, sits, that melts on the surface of the glacier and then can trickle all the way to the base of the glacier, if, even though it might be a mile thick, just under the the force of gravity alone. And then uh, there's basal melting, meltwater on the bottom of the glacier that the glacier glides on. So th the whole point is that when you begin to think through the process, it doesn't hold up, it doesn't make sense. 
And yet, when you begin to talk to some of the geologists, well, what you'll see is that in the computer modelings that they've done, this is what one of the one of the most sophisticated computer modelings of the whole ice dam scenario that they've done so far involves the ice being there 24 to 2,500 feet thick. The water fills up, and when it hits 2,100 feet, it's at about 90 percent the, the, the depth of the ice. And because the ice is roughly 90 percent the density of water, once the water hits that level, it would then cause the ice to become buoyant. And so in their computer models, the ice is there 2,500 feet thick, the water raises up, it hits 2,100, and when it hits 2,100, the water pressure is now great enough to cause the whole ice dam to lift up and then the water goes out. That's one of the, that's one of the variations that they've got on it. But the assumption there, of course, is that you've got this completely, completely impermeable ice mass. If you actually look at a map of where the ice dam was supposed to be, the bottom of the valley is five miles wide. At the top, where the, where the ice and the water would meet, at, at the 4,200 foot above sea level, that's seven miles wide. So you can picture, you've got what they call the wetted perimeter. The perimeter of, of where the seal has to be is going to be somewhere around seven or miles or more, where it has to be a perfect seal, where no water can penetrate through that ice at all, none at all, because if any gets through, the whole ice dam is gone. Now there are, oh, hang on one second, I'll get, there are ice dams in the modern world that, that have been observed, several hundred of them over the last couple hundred years. What you see when you watch those, when you observe those and document those, is typically you will get a volume of water that it varies between one and two cubic miles maximum. The volume of Lake Missoula was 530 cubic miles. And you get three orders of magnitude. The biggest known outburst flood from a, from a glacially dammed lake was the Hubbard Glacier when it gave way in Alaska. And that, the big, that's the largest known, and it actually is quite a bit bigger than all of the other ones known. But typically, even the largest known one is three orders of magnitude less than one of the peak flows from Missoula flood. So in other words, three orders of magnitude would be a thousand times bigger. So in other words, the largest known peak discharge from a modern ice dammed lake breaking through its glacier is one thousandth of the volume of a Lake Missoula flow. So is it reasonable to just jump from there to this idea that, well, see, here's the problem. Once you lose that ice dam, then what do you do? Obviously, there was a great flood, a flood of epic proportions, a, a flood that you can't even begin to imagine until you've spent 10 years traveling back and forth across that landscape, putting, putting it together in your mind. At that point, you might actually begin to get a sense of what we're actually talking about here. We're talking about a flood that's of of such power that it's virtually inconceivable. But if you take the ice dam out of the equation, then what have you got? Dennis, what were you trying to say? Well, I let's see, there was a report yesterday that somebody, I haven't read it yet, somebody told me about it, saying that Iceland is prematurely cold this year and was really cold last year. And they're afraid that Iceland's gonna be one of its coldest years in years, one of its coldest winters in years. Let me tell you, we would much rather have a little bit of global warming than, than going into a little ice age. Charles, what were you going to say? You uh, haven't been brought out the fact that that much pressure would create the ice to melt. Yeah. yeah. The pressure at the bottom would have be melting because of that. Well, and that would be as deep or deeper than any lake in the country now. Is there anything that's 2,000 feet deep? No. I don't remember any of them on that list we printed out being over 2,000. Right. Crater Lake and Crater Lake, I think. Crater Lake is the deepest lake. And it might be that deep. But you know, think about that. Here you're talking about lakes that are being held in totally by bedrock. You know, by bedrock. So here we're a lake that's is deep or deeper than any uh, any lake in North America and it's supposed to be held in by ice. And and get I mean, re, really if you follow the, the current thinking, not only was there it wasn't just one ice dam. 
They're, they're up now to saying there was 89 ice dams. Oh my God. Well, you know what it's like. It reminds me of the, um, the Ptolemaic model of the solar system. You remember that from school? They were trying to explain um, uh, retrogression. What do you call it? Retro, retrograde. retrograde motion of planets by putting everything in circular orbits. And circular orbits were close, but not quite. And so what happened was, in order to, to actually make it work, they had to use efferents and epicycles and epicycles, and it got more and more and more and more complex and unwieldy. I remember an astronomy class, as an extra credit project, we were supposed to try to explain the Ptolemaic model. So I took that on, and I just remember it was... I mean, it was com the, you know, the, any scientific law, they say a good scientific law is simple. Yeah. You know, that's one of the rules of science, keep it simple. Well, then, of course, Kepler came along and just realized, well, instead of trying to explain all this motion by circles, perfect circles, with the Earth at the center, put the Sun at the center and make the perfect circles slightly flattened and make them ellipses, and boom, all of that complex stuff just went off the table and he came up with three simple laws. They're called Kepler's laws. And, and from that point on, suddenly astronomy just took leaps and bounds forward. You know, and it, it was the, the progress of astronomy had been retarded for over a millennium because of this unwieldy complex Ptolemaic model. So what allowed them to shift their consciousness to, go, to switch ideas? Because that's what you've got to have now is a shift in consciousness to go away from the ice dam to go to look at. Well, just somebody needs to come up with a much simpler model. It's one person who gets it and gets it out there. <laughs> that's really it. Well, yeah, that's where it starts. It starts with somebody proposing an alternative, having everybody object to them. But just like that guy, see, what's, what's really instructive about what you did is that, like you said, you, using the word religion, because it's not, it's with them, it's for him to invoke that ice dam is a matter of faith. It's not because he sat down and reasoned through it, because if he had, he'd go, wait a second. Something, something's not, you know, two and two isn't adding up here, you know. There is actually, though, a, a dissenting point of view that is emerging that is totally much more supportive of the model I've been proposing, which is a group of Canadian geologists who are saying the evidence, the field evidence, is supportive of the idea that there were massive water flows coming out of Canada. And I've already begun to say, and haven't you begun to detect this, Brad, that there's almost a, it's almost like us versus them mindset? Yeah. Oh, that's the Canadians. So the Canadians, yeah. the, oh, those Canadians, you know, those Canadians, they want to take credit for the flood. I got that in 1999, I think, or 2000, when we visited the Dry Falls Visitor Center, and I talked to the geology and re geologist in residence there, and he wasn't about to concede that there was anything other than this ice dammed lake, and the ice dam gave way. And when I pointed out some of the work that had already been published by the Canadians back then, that was his response. Oh, that's the Canadians wanting to take credit for it. You know, they, they want to get in on the action. And... In fact, this latest computer model thing that, you know, when we were out there, we had dinner with a geologist, and he seemed open and all this, and he, he was, he's with, was he Bureau of Land Management? Yeah. He was with Bureau, geologist with the Bureau of Land Management, and he had helped contribute to the latest computer-generated models of the ice dam. Um, and he sent me an abstract of this paper that has not yet been published. And he says he's going to send me the full paper when it comes out. But one of the things I noticed when I read the abstract was, is when they were setting up their, their data points in order to create this model, computer model, they state right in the abstract that their data points, they carried them up and stopped at the Canadian border. They say that right in the abstract. So I'm going, well, you know, as if, you know, you know, uh, hey guys, you know, you can't just arbitrarily say that what was going on back in the Ice Age had anything to do with this, you know, the 49th parallel, the Canadian border. But that's what they did. So as soon as I read that, I thought, well, clearly I think that's going to bias the outcome, you know. I mean, how are they going to come up with anything that suggests there was a Canadian source for the water if they don't even, if they just put Canada completely off the radar screen? But that's what they were doing. 
So anyways, he, we had a discussion with him, and I, I laid a few things on him, and I think he, I don't know, I'm hoping I, you know, he, he, he actually confessed. What was the words he used about in the back of his brain? Remember, what did he say? Yeah, he, he said something like that. I, he actually admitted that much. But in the back of his mind. Yeah, in the back of his mind. Yeah. But I, I, I emailed him back some questions about four or five days ago, and I haven't heard back from him yet. <laughs> so we'll see. Some Randall Laws before somebody else dies and puts their name. Well, hey, it's all getting documented here. So, um, Randall, what was your biggest surprise on this trip in terms of new information? Um, the biggest surprise was, uh, let's see, well, I guess, I don't know if there was any real surprises. There was more confirmation. You know, we got up along the Columbia, up by Kettle Falls, which is about 25 miles south of the Canadian border, and we saw hot, huge gravel silt bars that obviously had, you know, had been laid down by sweeping currents, you know, currents probably swinging from side to side down the down to Columbia. So that was further evidence that there was probably large-scale currents coming out of Canada. Um, and then of course, Glacier, seeing that and, and appreciating how, how massive the glacier, you know, when you see that one little corner there you, and you see these gigantic valleys, you can really appreciate how massive the glaciers were during the Ice Age. That, that, was, that was instructive to me. Well, the stop we made at the, the gravel bar on the field trip uh, where the young guy was speaking, and you got those sloped <coughs> layers, and he said, "Well, this is from water coming off the top of the ice." Right, right. That was a good. You know, and then yeah. The jets under down the falls. Right. Under the ice lobe under the lake. So you got you got mile wide, three hundred feet deep channels that were scoured in the fault lines, and you got massive water flows off the top of the ice, all coming south. They they weren't seeing the big picture at all. No, no. Because the model I've been presenting to you is one where basically there's a very intense thermal source coming from above and outside. And I even showed you, what, a month or two ago, where I think the, the, the ground zeros were, at least one of them. The one that would have melted the ice that contributed, that, that created the Missoula flood. And uh, I've also shown you the, the graphs of sea level change, which shows that there were two enormous spikes of meltwater introduced into the Atlantic Ocean. And I think that those two spikes of, of water, in other words, the sea level rise at the end of the Ice Age wasn't smooth from here to here. It was a sudden jump and then another jump. So it was like there were two huge spikes of meltwater introduced into the oceans. And I think that relates to two melting, to catastrophic melting events. And if I'm right, these catastrophic melting events were triggered by something outside. Where was the second one? The first one was in Canada. What do you think the second one was? The Indian? Mm, no, and that's got to be worked out. You see, here's the thing is that the first one didn't do it. If you remember, the first one at 12,900 caused a massive melting. The melting flowed out, but then everything refroze even colder than it had been in 3,000 years. See, the Younger Dryas, remember the Ice Age was in a state of warming when the first catastrophe had hit. After the first catastrophe hit at 12,009, this was what the beginning of the, the climate crisis they called the Younger Dryas, when it went back into the depth of full glacial cold, the way it had been 16, 17, 18,000 years ago. And that lasted for about a thousand years, and then the second catastrophic melting occurred. And with that second melting, then it, it apparently crossed some threshold that at that point the Ice Age was done with. Because then what you had was you went from a living ice cap, a living ice cap that's being replenished in the zones of accumulation that's moving like plastic taffy outwards in all directions, filling mountain valleys, you know, creating lobes and sublobes and moving, being nourished from above, flowing down to a tongue that's then melting at the tongue. But after the second catastrophe, what happened was it killed the ice sheet. Everywhere the ice just stopped. It was as if this nourishment that occurred at the accumulation centers of the ice sheets 
stopped. And now what you had was just huge masses of dead ice laying on the landscape, with laying there and, and then melting away over probably the next 1,000 years. And it was those, that melting, I believe, that created the subsidiary flooding that the geologists are misinterpreting as being 89 Lake Missoula's. Because they're not distinguishing between two characters, two fully distinct levels of event. One is you've got this catastrophic melting. Boom, something hits, a huge amount of thermal energy is released, hundreds of cubic miles, probably even thousands of cubic miles of water are, of ice are instantly converted to water. That water then begins seeking its shortest route to the ocean. And as it does this, it creates incredible geomorphic change. Okay, the first time that happens, it doesn't kill the ice sheet. The ice sheet actually is able to regroup itself and begin growing again. The second one takes down the ice sheet. After the second one, You've now got thousands of square miles covered with this dead ice that's laying there now, melting away. And I think that what has happened is the geologists haven't been able to differentiate between the catastrophic melting events and then, obviously, if you've got thousands of cubic miles of ice laying, like, from, from the Atlantic to the Pacific, you know, the Rocky Mountain Valleys are filled with thousands of feet of this dead ice. It's now melting away, presumably greatest melting in the summer, right? You're going to go through this, the seasonal melting. It's going to stop in the winter, but it begins to melt away. And so the geologists, I think, have failed to differentiate between the two different regimes of melting. And see, we're still at a complete loss as to what happened the second time that meant that the whole global climate shifted gears. The whole global climate shifted gears completely. And the ice went away and did not come back. In fact, it didn't come, the, the most the ice has come back since the big ice age ended was the little ice age. 1300 year, 1300 AD, when that little ice age started, the ice started growing during the little ice age, that was the biggest the glaciers had been in, in, in 11,000 years. And so you got to keep that in mind when we talk about ice caps disappearing now, is we're still seeing the demise of the Little Ice Age ice caps that were the largest they'd been in 10,000 years. So, but the source of energy, that's the thing I want to talk about tonight. And I want to get, get on to that because today is an auspicious day. What day is this? What's the date today? What's special about that date? The, the thing that Dennis doesn't want to hear about anymore, <laughs> the Great Chicago Fire, happened 137 years ago. What time is it? Let me see. <laughs> it's quarter to eight. Yeah, so in about another hour and 15 minutes, the shit hit the fan. All hell broke loose. Mrs. O'Leary's cow. That's right. Mrs. O'Leary's cow. Kicked over the ladder. Let me show you something here. You might want to see this. Is this what you're talking about, Sam? Is that her? That's the culprit, Mrs. O'Leary's cow. And look, there he is kicking over the lantern. Or she, sorry. Not Mrs. O'Leary's bull, Mrs. O'Leary's cow. So what was, well, Mrs. O'Leary's cow. Let's see here. Here's Mrs. O'Leary's cow. With headdress. With headdress. There's Mrs. There's the real Mrs. O'Leary's cow. What do you know about Hathor, the Egyptian goddess? What do you know about Hathor? Hathor. 